good evening everyone and also a very very happy feast on this day of feast of uh, ascension and uh, we are now in the last uh, lesson of this program uh, 24th lesson of this uh, online bible college pro program and i welcome you all all those who are participating and will be participating maybe later and also those who are unable to also participate i also wish them all good how we deal today with the book of revelation book of revelation uh, we know it is called apocalypse of john apocalypse of saint john and it is a book is a favorite source book for evangelical preachers and the fundamentalist group because they take this book to predict the end of the world wherever there is some great preachers evangelical preachers speak about end of the world they take up this book in hand and also there are so many other uh, confusions and uh, riddles in this book as we read than the first hand if anyone reads in the first hand just reading he will be utterly confused if you don't know the literary form the content or the historical background everything so many i have asked to um, have in so many years last, last 20 years i am taking classes to different groups and if we ask for the first time they will simply uh, tell us that i don't know anything it is confusing i cannot read and so in certain places we cannot read because thunder and lightning bloodshed so many things are uh, narrated in this book now what how we are going to give you the background of this book and little explanation in one and a half hours or two hours now because here i will tell you the background of the book of revelation and the purpose and also the structure and the literary form of the book and some insights of uh, passages that are very much confusing in general and uh, theological import of this book and finally i also leave to the our audience to take uh, to give me ask me your questions because you will have uh, gone through the book in at least the text of the bible you will have certain questions or doubts so you can always raise those questions so that i can answer and it will be beneficial to all the other participants so this is our program and just you you would have got that booklet if you have gone through and otherwise it will be also good to hear something from here the book puzzles the reader uh, for example the throne the scroll and the seal trumpers bowls four horsemen and the beast the scarlet woman uh million see millennial reign and so on and so on and so on so in this uh, uh context we must know the background of the book then only we must we will always understand first of all so when it was written there is a meaning when the time you see here we know christianity coming from actually yes started okay it is not started by jesus christ but their followers followed jesus christ and they became disciples of christ and those disciples you know first time in uh, this uh, antioch they were called christians christians and christianity we can call it later but christians they always going um, following the teaching of jesus and also of jewish old testament 
we come to know that there is only one God and faith and belief in one God is very, very strong for us. If that is so, we cannot accept idol worship, idolatry. And we are called uh, Jewish people, Jewish religion, Christianity, even Muslims. We are called religions of monotheism, monotheism. At the same time, the first century, uh, of when Jesus just yes uh, resurrected, appeared forty times. Apparition was forty days. Apparitions. Afterwards, he ascended into heaven. At that time, when the apostles were gathered and the Holy Spirit descended upon them, then they started. They started preaching the word of God, witnessing to Jesus Christ. He is the only God. Uh, he is the only Lord, and they were very clearly talking about believing that Jesus is the Lord and Master. We see from St. Thomas' uh, proclamation in St. John's Gospel in 2029, where it is said, My Lord, my God, that is the basic belief of every Christian. At the same time, the Roman rule at that time was insisting two things. First of all, we have to, the all people in the Roman Empire, uh, there is no bar of any religion. Everyone must worship the Rome goddess, the emperor, empire Rome, goddess Roma. <coughs> the secondly, uh, after the uh, advent of um augustus caesar everyone must think that the augustus caesar and all the young caesars are really the sons of god so they should be worshipped so the uh, empire insisted on the emperor worship and they built both for the empire and for the emperors many temples statues erected so many things at this time christians were yes they could not follow this one they could not uh, worship the empire or emperor but only jesus christ so they were singled out find, found out and they were persecuted so persecution on account of religion was really the starting point point this is very very important background secondly other factors we come to know that hunger deprivation because persecution is there for the christians hunger and for deprivation and also hostility and enmity on the part of the jews and on the part of the gentiles this was prevailing prevailing in the time of the early christian period and we come to know, in fact, the, there are challenges of faith in Christ. Among the Christian community, because of this uh, challenge, these challenges, these challenges, there were different types of Christians came up. First of all, some Christians thought we cannot survive in this persecution. So they denied the Christian faith. Secondly, many thought, this is some many, many, maybe, maybe around 60% of the Christian community who accepted Jesus Christ thought that for survival, we have to go for compromise, life of compromise. So you look, you look as if you are worshiping the emperor, but at the same time in the heart, you worship Jesus Christ. So this is more of compromise. The policy of compromise was there. Then that's why he brings uh, many examples, like the woman like Jezebel, Jezebel, the watersman of kings. We come to know from the book of Kings that she, with her power, 
she manipulated the people injustice brought to people and also he will say nicola times nicola time mean nico nico means in greek victory what do you, they thought what is the basis of victory in life life of compromise if you compromise okay you go ahead if you don't compromise then you suffer that's why they were promoting this type of uh, uh, policy and uh, to Pergamum church he will say you are neither hot nor cold so that is a problem of uh, the lukewarm feet people had now finally we have some people really very very firm in their christian faith and they said even we die we we are we are no problem of our faith and in the chapter 12 verse 11 you will say they conquered him him means the anti-christian forces the the christians they call we can call them martyrs in a way they conquered him by the blood of the lamb blood of the lamb means death and resurrection of jesus christ or the great power the grace of jesus christ that is the blood of the lamb and by their words of witness witness and the author adds there they never cling to life they were even ready to die so that was the position of some christians so at this time now the author so now itself i can say author normally it is said john the apostle apostle because there's a lot of correlations between john's gospel and book of revelation a uh, lot of relationship first of all jesus is called lamb of god both in the gospel and in this book and also we say the word of god word of god theme is dealt both in this book and also in book of revelation then we see when the people of god are denoted in both as the spouse and also we see so many other the for example the uh, light all those things are we have also the uh, spiritual life spiritual life flowing as a stream of water a stream that uh, spirit of life of spirit flowing like a water it is both in john's gospel chapter 7 and here chapter 22 of revelation because of this ancient from the ancient time of um we we know from and um, from many many authors of third century till third century third century uh, everyone thought that it is written by john the apostle but then we come to know by closer study even in third century uh, the Anusius of alexandria he said he said even after martin luther and other people because of there are discrepancies some many uh, basic discrepancies both in this book and also john's gospel for example the style and uh, also the language of language of, uh, seen in both books are different and also the important theme of fourth gospel john life light darkness and truth falsehood judgment love paraclete all these things are missing in book of revelation so also the lamb term is used in both places both john and revelation using different greek words amnos in john's gospel arnion in revelation so at this so therefore it is the general opinion today that it is not directly john the apostle wrote it but it is the followers of john the apostle wrote it and 
that follower is happened to be also named by name john that's why it is called revelation of john uh, and he on account of persecution what i said the theme of persecution he was sent to patmos patmos you know it is in the aegean sea a small island barren island and in the time of the author he was it was a barren sent people roman empire sent uh, people to this island and uh, like uh, it is a punishment it's a prison island so he was sent that's why he says on account of the word of god i was sent to patmos in chapter 1 verse 9 uh, john the author says so when he went there he was preaching in the in the area of ephesus and so he knows very well the condition of the christians so some are betraying some are lukewarm some are very very uh, firm in their faith at this time he wants to write this book as a message to these uh, christians so those who are uh, betraying the christian faith he sent warning he sent warning through this book and those who are persevering in their faith he will give really encouragement and also persevere in your faith and fight for your christian faith that is the <clears throat> motive of the purpose of this revelation that is you know the purpose is so that <clears throat> endure enduring faith at the same time don't be uh, betraying your faith then god will punish you that is the message of warning also that is why we call this book it is a prophecy so literary form of the book is it is a prophecy because in he wrote it as a prophetic book he himself says in three places in first chapter 3 and 10 verse 10 and also another two places chapter 22 7 and 10 oh, and 18 so we in in altogether we see uh five <coughs> places he says this book is a prophecy why prophecy because <coughs> prophetic literature has two significant role in the old testament first of all they were giving warning to the people who are unfaithful to god secondly they were encouraging those people who are oppressed who are really persecuted so this book is also functions in the same way and also he wrote this man wrote it as a letter because he is living in part most in a island where an island and uh, uh, he wrote it sent that letter through the sailors some fishermen people to ephesus in the area of ephesus there were seven christian communities he named them he named them these seven christian communities and uh, why seven there could have been 10 but he named them only seven because two things first of all he wants to write it to these people <clears throat> particularly the seven churches seven communities seven different villages at the same time the word number 7 is important for him it uh, denotes the universality universality the fullness fullness so that's why we we say he wrote it not only to those people in that time but to, to all the people all through the centuries even today the book is relevant for us then he also writes it as a drama because the central theme of this book is the end of the evil the victory of the good that's why the evangelical preachers think are take up only that point 
end of the evil starts from chapter 8 onwards talks talks and uh, he goes on we see in chapter 19 we know the end of the evil complete evil and 2021 new heaven and a new year so that's why the people think it is here uh, speaks about the end of the world but it is not true because he never thought of one in there is end of the world but there is no mention about the time the time and uh, where and when how all those things is not there only one message is surely surely there will be the end the destruction of the evil completely and uh, victory of the good good means not only god but the whole people who are attached to the good goodness of god that's why he he writes it as a drama uh, enact to be enacted in the different communities this one so that the message will be reaching to each and every one that's why we see why drama we we talk about there is a hero jesus christ who activates the director god the father and we know the heroine the persecutor church and all those people who are with uh, with the persecutor church the good people the angels are there and there is a villain dragon dragon is the evil the devil but at the same time in the world we never see any particular image of dragon or we don't see the devil as such but we see the agents of devil that's why he talks in chapter 13 the sea beast and land beast so we will i will explain to you later but these two beasts are called we can know they are agents of evil so and finally there is a fight between the hero and the here and the villain and finally we come to know the hero uh, kills or destroys completely completely the villain the devil and puts them under the bottomless pit or then brings them to put it in the lake of fire coming eternal destruction so this is the story at the end we come to know that only good is existing that's right but at the same time my dear brethren it is an apocalyptic literature so if you understand this point then we will understand the book very clearly what is apocalypse it is a greek word apo plus calypsis we have to break these two into two apocalypses apo means away from calypsis is covering meaning that's the meaning so away from covering means that means i unfold it i unfold it i reveal it that's why it is called the book of revelation <clears throat> that's why we call it it is the apocalypse so we see why what is this apocalypse the nature of apocalypse literature what is it first of all it is uh, written in the context of persecution of the good oppressed people in the context of oppression the book is written in order to say the oppressor the evil will be completely destroyed so that is the uh, main context of this book so that we come to know that the apocalypse is written it is not the invention of the christian community like john but it is the invention of their jewish people who wrote between 200 bc to 100 a.d those 300 years whenever they had a political religious persecution under the rule of greeks under the rule of romans under the rule of uh, other uh 
persecutions like a Babylonian rule. So they wrote this type of literature uh, so that they can bring the message of uh, goodness or message of victory to those people. For example, they wrote, we you know, the book of Enoch is of that type. Then in the Old Testament, we know only one important book is Daniel of this type, Daniel. So following this apocalyptic uh, literature of uh, literature of oppressed people or uh, in the context of oppression, church is also in the context of oppression. So he took up this style, literary style of uh, the apocalypse and wrote it. Uh, wrote it. Why well, here in apocalyptic literature, it is always told in symbolism. Symbolic symbolism plays very very important role because symbols are very very important. It will not give you direct address. It will not address to the uh, ruling uh, uh, outfit directly, but symbolically because the oppressed people will be uh, much more oppressed if they talk freely when there is a then that's why he brings the visions um the idea of vision then they bring the mediation of the angels here and most of the time these books are written in pseudonymity that means pseudonymity means with typical of literary of apocalyptic literature to avoid further persecution so they will never say even see they will never say the real author's name but they will write in another name like book of daniel book of daniel the daniel prophet was uh, living in the eighth century but when a book was written in the oppressed context in the third century bc then they named it book of daniel so that is the thing but the this book our book of revelation is an exception because he wrote in his own name john apocalypse john at the end he says why because everybody knows that he is caught persecuted and deported to ireland so he doesn't want to uh, hide his name he wants to directly uh reveal <coughs> who is writing and this christian community will know him that he is the brother in persecution tribulation so he wants to directly tell them that's why in this book he writes his name now in this uh, we see uh, the apocalypse literature i told you symbolism is very very important if you read if you understand the symbolism in this book then we understand most of the messages symbolism of you know the cosmic symbolism sun moon then lightnings and uh, all those things are there or uh, the human some symbolism the woman with the uh, 12 stars human symbolism uh, animal symbolism you know horses um frogs and uh, uh, also locusts in chapter 11 and so many <clears throat> animal symbolism we see a lion or lamb so we have many symbolism now we also have the symbolism of uh, numbers numbers so we will see one by one little then we will uh, go to the other explanation now see before we close this one um we see uh, the symbolism of images color or uh, materials animals i told you also uh, human and beings purpose color purple represents luxury and black represents death white represents okay victory and red represents the struggle. So we know there are four different horses in chapter six, in the beginning. 
we know white horse comes what's the meaning of white horse see you will be victorious he telling the audience you will be victorious when you will be victorious red cause comes what is the red cause you have to struggle in faith you have to endure in faith so that our victory cannot come will not come without any price the price is my struggle then he brings in the stage white uh, black horses what is a black you see if you fail then you will be destroyed then we also see the pale green horse it's a very very strange color because we don't see any horse in pale green in fact but at the same time in his imagery in his vision he brings that one so that to show pale green represents the the pestilence the great tribulations who will be uh, having a problem those people who are not firm in their faith who are making compromise in life and their mind and heart will be always perturbed they are even be that is a reality even today today in order to save my name i say a lot of lies i say a lot of cheating i do a lot of cheating and i become materially maybe successful at the same time my conscience will prick my conscience will always betray you then you will have the experience of pale green horse you see also in these trumpets you know trumpet is a, it is called in the book of revelation is a call a symbol of divine voice divine voice and also sharp sword sharp sword we know in luke chapter uh, two we talk about sharp sword will pierce your heart our lady's heart that's told by simeon but at the same time we also see the sword um, imagery also in the old testament in psalms so sharp sword means word of god word of god many a time book of revelation speaks also we see white robe you will see in chapter 7 he said there is an expression they their garment became white by dipping their garment into the blood of christ something very strange but at the same time is very very rich image rich imagery they the government are their means uh, is their life their life it becomes white their life becomes victorious how by dipping their life into the blood of christ that means blood of christ means death and resurrection of jesus it's not only death it's not only really crucifixion but we have to see always the death and resurrection of jesus saint paul will say if you die like christ you will rise like christ romans chapter 6 he will say very clearly so that is the meaning of uh, uh, that uh, imagery um, that dress and so you are you, you have to robes white robes are robes white robes we see and also we see wings wings four wings and so many times we have seen two wings given to the woman in chapter 12 verse 14 so wings mobility means mobility and horns in chapter 6 we see horns and eyes the the lamb of god lamb comes with the seven seven eyes and seven horns so here horn means power represents power i represents knowledge that's why the psalm the hymn written to praise the lamb of god praise jesus christ they will say 
you are worthy to be praised because you are you know everything you are all powerful almighty that's why it is said and so knowledge how we know the also yeah, we instead of going now i want to speak later about the woman in chapter 12 at the same time the woman in chapter 17 so the contrasting woman we will talk very clearly before that i just want to mention something about the imagery images of number number one represents god god because he is one number two we see two olive trees two lampstands in chapter 11 represents doubling of energy number three represents also god because god is in three persons father son and the spirit so number three number four represents the universal created being universal three created being why four because the creation is extended in four different directions north south east and west that's a olden imagery olden uh, we see people how the ancient people saw the world it's not world is round as we see today but it is uh, uh, spread out in four directions that's why four now if you say if four three is representing god four represents creation then three plus four seven seven is fullness very very important theology here because the creation is, without god is not full it cannot be complete it cannot achieve its goal at the same time the creation is there to praise and worship god and we realize Godheadness through the praise and worship of the created being. And so we come to realize and feel God is there always. Without our world also, God is there. At the same time, we feel the presence of God. We feel because we, the created people, are with him we need him that's why we see three and four seven represents fullness and this book uses 52 times number seven wants to give importance to number seven and what is six one minus seven one minus seven six means imperfect imperfect so there in chapter 13 verse 18 we come across that this person represents is triple six 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 it's very clearly said what does that mean we can say in theologically and also historically and symbolically numerically we talk about first of all theologically six means imperfect and Twice six is more imperfect. The most imperfect person is triple six. Now, who is that person? See, normally in chapter six, it talks about it. It talks about Demetrius, the ruler, the emperor of the time of the writer. But at the same time, the other things about are places Nero in the person of uh, Domitian. So he wants to indicate the rule of the Nero at that time. That's why the name Nero is numerically spelt. So we say, uh, we, we talk about Nero, um, the name Nero, Nero Caesar. It is written, Caesar Nero. It is written. So when you talk about Nero and Kesa, that's why, if you give the numerical value of these uh, letters, letters, they all come together and they become 
666. So that is the meaning of uh, the numerical riddle of that one, but representing Nero. Why Nero? Nero died in 68, but the book is written in 85. 85. But the, uh, the emperor ruling in the year 85 represents Nero through his persecuted policy, persecution, oppressed policy, and through his arrogance. And he wanted, he, he gave a rule that everyone in the emperor must worship him. So he was so cruel like Nero. He is representing Nero. So that is the meaning of uh, the number, uh, the image of number. See, I told you, see the Nero. Uh, Nero and Kesa, uh, if you really go through this one, it is uh, representing that one. Now, this book we come to know. Um, the imagery of evil is talked about dragon. Dragon. Hey, why dragon? You see, in the Old Testament, we come to know that the dragon, that uh, means the evil or the devil, is uh, existing in the world. Nobody can deny. Even in the book of Genesis, the first parents were created very, very in the likeness and image of God. But at the same time, how could they turn away from God? How could they sin against God? It, it cannot be initiative from people, from men, women. No, because they were created by God and they were really uh, having the image of God. At the same time, Bible speaks about the fall of the first parents. Why? Because there is evil. Now it is a mystery. <clears throat> so when uh, we talk about the imagery of the evil, that is also very much uh, spelt here. See, we know in general, we know from the book of uh, Genesis and other books in the Old Testament, the, uh, the evil force is there, the evil force. Our first parents were created with, uh, without any, any problem, without any uh, mistakes or anything, or even defects, limitation, nothing. Only they were given God's grace of freedom. That's the only thing. But then they were induced, allured by the devil. Now, where is the devil? Who created devil? Who created devil? It's a mystery nobody knows at the same time. It was a question also lingering in the heart, mind of the Jewish people. Who we also feel the anti-God elements in life an evil force is very much in the world. See, they thought even sickness caused by the devil and death is caused by the devil. Even Paul will say also the same. We, uh, the sin, we incurred death on account of sin, he will say. So all those things. In, a, in fact, who created devil? That's the question. No answer. They could not find any answer. At the same, in the Bible, there is no answer. But at the same time, there is a apocryphal book outside the Bible. Apo is outside. Crypal is right, outside the writing. So that is out, writing outside the Bible. The written, some books outside the Bible. Like a, a book of Enoch. I know. It says, about the origin of the Bible, origin of the evil. First of all is God created, they say in that book, angels. Angels, 
to worship him to be his instrument to worship him and souls to be his instrument agents of good angels are agent agents are uh, agents of good that's why even here our man john in the book of revelation writes angels the christians also are angels he writes so it's the meaning of angels we christians are agents of god instrument of god that's the meaning at the same time uh, this uh, evil how it came when god created angels some angels disobeyed they were put down and they became the evil spirits that's so answer given by book of enoch it is written in the second century bc in order to satisfy the answer how from where the devil comes but we 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 have not seen devil but we are experiencing the evil in our life that's why he calls it dragon the um, book of revelation calls it dragon and we also see the same thing in the old testament we see in in uh, isaiah 27 all those places that it is the called the great uh, uh, snake and so so many different ways it is uh, narrated in the uh, in the old testament we see that one that's why dragon or the great snake great snake we see it um that's why in this book we see the, it becomes a mythic story he he uses as a myth that when we talk about the book of uh, other some passages we will come to know very very clearly now with the with this we come to know um, the note on the book of uh, revelation like thorns and so all those things we are already told and so we come to know certain passages <laughs> very clearly so now chapter one okay we one and two and three and four and five these five chapters are introductory chapters or even for yes five chapters introductory chapters how first of all in chapter one he introduces he introduces the author I, John, in chapter 1, verse 9, he introduces also the hero in a short form, that is in chapter verses 12 onwards, 12 to 20. And he, in chapter 2, he introduces 2 and 3, the audience, or the hero in the church, the church, church, the local churches, in Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Theatria, Sardis, Philadelphia, and so. And uh, we, Laudokia also we come to know also. So they are, those, uh, they are their goodness and their limitations, weakness of faith is introduced in foretold very clearly in these two uh, chapters. They are the samples of the church of early church and we also have the same experience in today also in our christian churches there are people of good faith strong faith and persevere in their struggle and they are rewarded like with so many different um, at the end you will say I will make uh, me images, we say, I will make you the pillar in heaven. I will give you the uh, ring, the golden ring in you. So I will give you to eat the fruit of the tree. These are all, all these seven blessings, promises. They are all 
only representing eternal life, those things. So these are all there, and we also come to know how the people are dissuaded uh, to go against God, and so all those things are very clearly spoken. In chapter 5, we come to know really the, the, the hero and what type of hero we have. So what type of hero in chapter 5? The Lamb of God. We know from John I in literature, that means John's Gospel, John the Baptist star, uh, proclaims and indicates, uh, indicates or points out Jesus as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That is the image given by John the Baptist to Jesus. Here, here in John's uh, revelation, there are two things are mingled together. In chapter 5, verse 6, they were waiting for the hero, the line of Judah. They are waiting to break open the seal, that means covered the message of God, and uh, reveal to the people, suffering people, what is the message of God. Now they were waiting for line of Judah. Line of Judah, you know, the Messiah, but people's thinking, Jewish thinking is the glorious Messiah, the political Messiah. That's why they thought about line of Judah. Now the lamb comes as if it is slaughtered, slaughtered, that is in the cross, crucified on the cross, sacrificed on the cross, at the same time. He is coming and standing with the seven eyes and seven uh, horns. That is the meaning is that he is fighting. He is not dying Jesus in the cross, but he is fighting lamb. He is, a, he is called warrior lamb with a full of knowledge and power. That is what the hero, the other presence, the hero, who is fighting, fighting against my oppressed situation, fighting against my oppressor. Who is that oppressor? Uh, Roman Empire and the, all the um, collaborators of Roman Empire of that time. Even today, we come to know so many different um, oppressors we have, in so many different in political life, or social life, or media, and so many we have anti-Christian elements, but who will fight for me? Jesus, the warrior lamb will fight for me. That's a message of hope and encouragement so that I can always have great faith in Jesus who will be with me. So that uh, image is brought in chapter 5. In chapter 6, you know, God he is giving indication uh, of uh, Good, three indications. First of all, he talks about if you are faithful, you will be victorious. That is first uh, four verses. Then we come to know then the innocent people. What is the state of innocent people, oppressed people? With our own mighty, with our own power, we cannot fight. I have, I have also personally experienced, we cannot fight myself. The, all the evils that are lashed out, that are brought against Christians. But then I have to pray to God. I have to pray to God. That's why they will say, when will you take avenge, avenge or revenge against uh, our enemies? That's the that's pe innocent people pray to God. That's the way. That's the way. The third one in chapter 6, we come to know that the wicked people will always be afraid of God's punishment. They will not be peaceful in life, very clearly says. And at one time, some will come, a time will come, they will go for suicide. They will ask the mountain to fall on them. They will ask the deep water to swallow. It's all there in that book, in that verses. Why? Because the wicked people, evil people, very clearly says, if you 
forget God. You will always approach the nature for your protection. So we come to know many a time people troubled with those who un unfaithful people or they have no God's real faith in God or belief in God. They will always seek people, uh, persons, things and places for their protection. This is a reality, not that time, every day, every time, till the end of the world, end of the world. That's why very clear it says. Then in the story we come, the author talks about some consolation, con consoling message in chapter 7, that is, uh, he talks about 144,000 people. That's nothing but 7 into 7 into 1,000. So that is a large number. That's a meaning. A large number of good people, victorious people will be there. How they will be victorious? He talks about every tribe, 12,000. That is only symbolic. Symbolic. But how they will be victorious? They will dip their robe, that means life, in the blood of the Lamb, that is with the, uh, uh, with the death and resurrection of Jesus. They will always be victorious. That's why it is very clearly talked. Now from 8 onwards, 8, 9, uh, these two chapters talks about the destruction of evil in the world, one third of destruction, because it is a slow uh, progressive storytelling, progressively, that is one third in the form of uh, Exodus story. He talks about how one third of destruction will come. So in chapter 8 and verse 9, you will you must know verse chapter 9, that is one locust story. Locust comes. <laughs> how it can be an instrument of destruction? You see, locusts in the normal life we see very, very weak. But God puts in it the lion's mouth, the horse's uh, leg, back, and uh, women's uh, uh, hair, and so many other things are there put into that and makes it a powerful, destructive element. And what's the meaning? For God, nothing is impossible that's the meaning if you read that chapter oh god can bring us happiness when by all means he will bring uh victory even through locus that's the meaning and also in that chapter we come to know in, uh then they praise and worship god then chapter 10 one important verse is there chapter 10 speaks about the word of god Word of God, really, if you really live the word of God, it is not so easy. It is bitter. It is bitter in our life. Really. Our lady was told by some Simon, your heart will be pierced by your sword. That sword is word of God, pierced. And many, many problems will come. Yes, it is true. If I don't live, if I just read, if I just read and, and write or speak about the word of God, even that is very easy, like sweet as in the mouth, like a honey. It is a imagery taken from Isaiah, book of Isaiah, chapter 3. Word of God is very easy for us to attend the classes, to read the books of the Bible, to write about all those things. Even write books, very easy. But for me and for you, to put into practice the message of the word of God, it is great. It is like a, it will uh, be bitter in your mouth. It, it, it is not bitter in your mouth, in your stomach. Sweet in your mouth, but bitter in your mouth. That's the meaning of... Uh, that uh, <clears throat> phrase imagery in chapter 10. As chapter 11, we see that uh, for two witnesses. What's the meaning of two lampstand? Lampstand is the light, 
light, giving light. Witness, uh, olive tree is a very, very strong tree in Israel. That means very strong witnessing Christian. It, it represents not Peter and Paul, not this or that, not Moses and Elijah. People distort the message. But according to the biblical revelation, the John's revelation, it represents the very, very witnessing church, witnessing Christians. That's why if you are a witnessing Christian, you can, <clears throat> you can, like Elijah or Elisha, you can uh, make wonders, bring wonders in the world. Like uh, Mother Teresa brought in wonders. Like our Francis, Pope Francis brings wonders of mercy and uh, companionship or a lot of things, synodality, so many things. You can bring wonders at the same time. You will be tortured. That's why the book says very clearly, you will be tortured and put in the uh, streets like your master Jesus Christ, who was crucified in, in uh, Jerusalem. You will be tortured. But don't worry. The book says in chapter 11, at the end, don't worry. As the, as the oppressed people, oppressors see, you will rise to life. That's a big message of consolation, the book says in chapter 11. In chapter 12, we see woman with the, uh, 12 stars. Very, very prominent, very, very common, very, very popular chapter in the book of Revelation. Many people read this chapter during the time of Feast of Our Lady. What does it mean, Our Lady here? So if you read the book very carefully, the book speaks about really the persecuted church. Now, the woman in chapter 12, in the normal, in the simple eyes, it might look like Our Lady, true. Our Lady is part and parcel of the church. The faithful church. At the same time, what's the real meaning? Real meaning. See, the 12, star, 12 stars represent 12 apostles. No, before that, 12 patriarchs. Patriarchs. Then, what's the meaning of who are the uh, formed with the 12 patriarch people of Israel? At the same time, this woman, bring, this Israel, the woman, brings forth the child. What is the child? Messiah, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is the child of the people of Israel, in gentle, even though he is the child born of Mary, Our Lady. Our Lady is a part and parcel of representing Israel, people of Israel. That's why we come to know that after the birth of Jesus, the woman represents church. The belief, the faithful church is the real, the woman. Because after the birth of Jesus, now the woman struggles. The church struggles in life under the persecution of the devil, evil, evil forces. So this is the story. And after the persecution of the, the, after the birth of the child, the Jesus resurrection, Jesus resurrection, ascension, everything we see. But then who are we? Where are we? We are in the world. Left out in like a desert journey. Chapter 12 very clearly speaks in verse three, 13 onwards. Desert journey. And our life in the world is a, like a desert journey. In with the lot of persecution, trials and tribulations are there. At the same time, we need not worry. God gives us two wings. Chapter 12, verse 14. What are two wings? One is the word of God, another other is sacraments. In the Catholic Church, we are, we can always 
get rid of all temptations and tribulations, all our persecutions, we can get rid of, we can overcome only through the power of the word of God and power of the sacrament. People don't understand that church is built up into word of God and the sacraments, especially the Eucharist. Eucharist. So people, that's Vatican II, very clearly speaks. But Vatican II speaks in now, but first century itself, the, world, the, the book of Revelation, John spoke in those days. The woman, from first woman give, is given two wings to escape the dangers of the dragon. Now, who is the dragon? Dragon, yes, it is the devil, but represented by it at that time. Today is different. At that time, through Roman Emperor. Roman Emperor is having also seven horns and so many things, other things, because he is also rich. He is also having so many different chieftains or small kings and very, very powerful. And the tail is going even to the end of the world. That means so much is the Roman Empire. All roads lead to Rome. That was the expression. The whole world is under Roman Empire. That's why very, very powerful. At the same time, the Roman Emperor, before birth of Christ, persecuted the people of Israel, faithful people of Israel. After the birth of Jesus, the same faithful people became Christians, persecuted Roman Empire. That's why we see there the, the symbolism of dragon and the woman. So there is a fight, or we cannot say fight, but there is a struggle between the woman and the dragon. But the dragon could not succeed. You see, normally the evil can succeed individual Christians who are not connected to community. If you are going away from the faithful community, you will be tracked. You will be led astray. But if you are if we are united together, like BCC, like so many other groups, we are united together, then we cannot be easily tempted by the evil forces even today. That's what he says, it cannot. Then, 13 and 14, 13 especially, he talks about the uh, very, very devastating image of our activities of dragon, how it could be, it was. So it talks about uh, dragon is working on like a sea beast, sea beast is coming from the, the devil, sea represents the abode of evil, coming from the devil, the emperor, and also land beast spread out all the officials who also execute the evil policy of the emperor, very, very clearly speaks in chapter 13. And 14, we see, yes, at this time, Jesus the Lamb stands at the uh, Mount Zion and going to destroy evil. It is imagery. What is the Mount Zion? Mount Zion for me, for Israel, represented Jerusalem, the Jerusalem temple. Psalm 137, very clearly said. By the rivers of Jab um, Babylon, we remembered Zion, he talked. But that for Christians, for us, when chapter 14, verse 1, talks about Zion, it represents Mount Calvary. If you go to Jerusalem, you will know Mount Zion and Mount Calvary is on the same line, the same parallel line. So what is Mount Calvary? In Mount Calvary, Jesus Christ fights for me, fights against evil and destroys evil. Once he was uh, rose from the dead, already the devil is destroyed. Why? Death is the instrument, lost instrument of devil. Once the death is destroyed, devil is destroyed. That is the meaning here. 
in chapter 14. And 14, we will see evil, wicked will be destroyed, destroyed also. The harvest scene is spoken in that chapter 14. That is how the wicked people will be destroyed. It's a message of consolation, we can say. In 15 and 16, we see another one third of destruction, how it will be. It is narrated very, very graphic, graphic uh, graphically narrated in the according to the story of Exodus, how God saved the Israelite people in Egypt. So in the same way here, he talks about. In 1616, you will come across one word, Armageddon. What's the meaning of Armageddon? Evil people, evil people, or the spirits, they say, he sees, Will be will gather in Armageddon. What's the meaning of Armageddon? Har Magadon. Har plus Magadon. Har means mountain in Hebrew. Magadon is uh, another form of uh, the place called Megiddo. Megiddo in North Israel near Carmel Hill. Carmel Hill. Now, Har is mountain that is representing Carmel Mountain. Here, Megiddo is. So, Har Megadon is, which is nearer to the mountain, the Megiddo. Megiddo is the place where lot of before Christ and after Christ also happened. Many a time. Between Egypt and Babylon, between North Israel and South Israel, between Syria and Israel. So many, uh, why Megiddo? Megiddo is the battlefield in those olden days. Now he, he takes up that imagery and puts it here that, see if you are a good person, really brother, uh, for brothers and sisters, there will be people, people, they will come together to not only to speak against you, to devise against you, to destroy you. How Jesus experienced the Pharisees and Sadducees often met together. How to destroy Jesus? The same thing will happen even today. Don't worry. He says, don't worry. That will be destroyed. So that's the meaning. In 17, we see the woman. Contrast to the woman in chapter 12, here the woman is Roman Empire, is symbolically told woman, and her all her wickedness is narrated in a very, very graphic manner. Uh, the Holy Spirit takes him to the sea. See, see, the woman seated on many waters. What is the meaning of many waters? The woman is Roman Emperor. Roman Empire, Empire is spread out of many, many seas and oceans, Arabic Sea, Mediterranean Sea, Black Sea, Atlantic Sea, so a lot of seas we see. And uh, the uh, woman is Roman Empire, seat, seated in many water at the same time. He says after some time, I will take you to the desert, I will see the woman. What's the meaning? The woman is very, very cruel that it destroys everyone and makes people, destroys people, makes the world a desert. So very, very graphically it talks about. After that, you see the final destruction is going to come. Before the final destruction, the author wants to talk about, uh, it is a, a dramatic way. Before the death of one evil man or woman, then there is our evil or good, anyone, anyone, there is a, a lamentation. Now, in chapter 18, there's a big lamentation, very, very oriental form of lamenting over death people is written very, very nicely in chapter 18 that the the empire, Roman Empire, will be destroyed. And before destruction, lamentation, he writes, 
in order to show, in order to talk, uh, speak about the surety, the firmness, the very, very clearly the evil will be destroyed. That's very clear. Then comes chapter 19. Then it starts with, you see, chapter 19 starts with the Alleluia. What's the meaning Alleluia? You know, praise to God. Al is God eh, in Arabic, also in Aramaic. So Alleluia means praise to God. That's a Aramaic term. Aramaic term. But we are using all these days in Easter season, Alleluia, Alleluia, many, many times. What's the meaning? Praise God, praise to God, like that. So they were praising, worshiping God. So because the evil is destroyed. Is destroyed means going to be destroyed. That's the meaning, very, very uh, symbolically talked here. And also in chapter, uh, in that, there is also marriage feast, talks about marriage feast. What is a marriage feast? It's a very, very joyful event uh, because the hero, Jesus Christ, is going to be joined with the heroine. Our persecuted church is going to be joined with the Jesus Christ, the hero. That is a, uh, is a Pauline imagery. The church is the bride. Bridegroom is Jesus Christ. It's a Pauline imagery. Uh, is used by the author in the second part of chapter 19 and third part speaks about real fight real fight jesus or the word of god or the person who is uh, on the horse white horse representing victorious but full of blood because struggle at the same time fight fighting the evil so blood comes not big this blood is not his blood it's the blood of the evil people because he fights that's a very very uh, noble way it represents jesus christ very clearly then actually this book does not talk about real fight he prepares for the fight the other one prepares for the fight but at the end you know the the lamb or the hero just takes the hero and the villain and puts it in the lake of fire one word there is no fight because you cannot nobody can fight against god god is so powerful nobody can fight against god even the evil even the devil cannot fight in chapter 12 there is a fight between michael and the dragon <coughs> why why michael brought because he represents God. Even there, there is no fight. In chapter 12, verse 9, verse 10, it talks about He took, he put the, he threw the dragon into the down. He threw down. That's where it is. So, with, uh, in the, there is no real, cannot be real fight between good and Good means God, God and evil. That's very clearly the theology of the the uh, of God. I mean, theodicy, we say, theology of God, very clearly speaks about that one. Now, once the whole thing, now in chapter 20, uh, we see uh, there is a still that uh, 100,000 years is put down the devil is put down only the devil is there all the other people are gone devil is there put down for one thousand years that means for a long time god wants to jesus wants to show to people what is world without evil then after some time the dragon is or the devil is leased out went out came out i mean so, uh freed by the jesus christ but then without knowing with he is uh, the devil he doesn't know the power of god so he wants to gather again his own people let's say kog and mago it is said what's the meaning of kog and mago those 
This is a place where the evil people gather. This is a place like Armagadon, same name. Kogan Mago in chapter 20, verse 8, you will see. There, what's the meaning? Evil people he gathered, but nothing happened. Everyone, including the devil, were thrown into the lake of fire. That's the, the book. There we see. In 20 chapter, we see everyone. Then we see the, the general judgment. See the Jesus Christ seated at the right hand of God and becomes the judge. My dear brethren, we are living in the time of mercy, in the time of consolation, in the time of salvation today. But a time will come, Jesus will come again, that will be not be a time of mercy, that will not be time of uh, uh, any uh, compassion, uh, it will be a time of judgment. And it is very clearly said on that time, that place, that everyone will be judged according to his deeds. This is not new to the book of Revelation, spoken by Jesus, spoken by St. Paul, many places we see everyone will be judged according to his own deeds. So we will come up again, both living and the dead will come up in front of Jesus, who will judge according to our own deeds. And those who are good people will not, will not be punished, will not be uh, uh, destroyed, but evil people will be banished will, to their eternal death or eternal destruction. Now you must see, now where is the destruction of evil, destruction of the world, end of the world, where is it? Book does not talk. End of the world is, end of the evil world is true. End of the evil world is true, but not good people. End of the good people, no. They will live forever with God. That's what the book says. So when people talk, evangelists or any other people talk about the end of the world, people write books when they see all calamities in the world, natural or man-made, so many tsunami or this uh, uh, coronavirus, everybody wrote uh, end of the world about end of It is not true. It is not true. End of the world, yes. When? Who? The evil will be destroyed. That is for them end, but not for good people. Those who are dead today will be also raised up according to their deeds. They will be given eternal life. So today, our saints for 2000 years, even before Moses and other people, they are all living in God, uh, buried according to our own concept, but they are living in God. They will not be destroyed. So this is the way. Then he talks about 21, 22. What will be the new heaven and the new earth without any, any sin? Or without any distraction or without any tribulation trials. That is heaven, way new heaven and new earth. Because when God created in John, Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we see the heaven and the earth. Nothing was lacking. Now, because of sin, so many things happened at the end. Then Jesus Christ had to come to save us, and He will save us everyone and once those who are faithful people will be saved evil will be destroyed the world will be without any evil and that world is the new heaven because the old heaven is now coming back the new heaven and the new year in now in chapter 22 we see about the nature of the new heaven and the new earth, what will be? There will be no tears, there will be no darkness, there will be no temple. Why temple? Because the whole world is God's temple. And light, there is no light because the Lamb is the light. Jesus Christ is the light. Very, very 
graphically, very wonderfully talks about the new heaven and the new earth in order to propose to us that we are journeying to us that one. Now, what is today book of Revelation? You must think about it. I want to end up it. Book of Revelation today is very, very relevant because we are also from the time of creation today on tomorrow and so we will be living in in the influence of devil influence of evil we good people will always be persecuted but john paul said francis pope our francis says very clearly we will be minority even though the whole world two-third are christians in namesake but those who are faithful people are minority and oppressed people. We will be always persecuted. That is true. At the same time, we have to take courage, persevere in faith. That is the book of Revelation. In perseverance, you must fight against God. Fighting is not violence, taking violence, but fighting is endurance in our own struggle. That is one fight. Secondly, when we leave a witness to life, witness to Christ, that witnessing life itself is a threat to the evil people. It will be really, we see in one, on the case of Nar, one sister Rani Maria in North India, she was persecuted, killed, and, and she died as a martyr. Then what happened? The one who killed became a Christian became a devout Christian afterwards. That witness persecuted them. So this is the revolt. So what if the people say, this book is a book of revolt. Revolt, not in the sense of violence, but in the sense of endurance. Endurance and speak for justice. Speak for justice. Stand Swami spoke for justice, lived for justice in the name of Christ. So he became, became martyr. But what is the use? Yes, those who killed him are persecuted. In a way, we will know. So this way is very relevant even today. At the same time, this book is not just very simple. It is a conclusion of the whole Bible. It's, a, it's not just the end of the Bible by chance. But it is the conclusion of the Bible because the Bible starts within heaven and the earth blissful heaven and earth blissful heaven and earth but because of weakness of human being because of the threat of the evil because of persecution so many things so many things happen happen then the book says don't worry one day the evil will be destroyed so once the evil is destroyed it is on the process yes then the new heaven and the new earth will come so the bible comes back the creation comes back the word of god comes back fully alive that is the meaning of uh, the book of revelation is really the conclusion of the word of god 